Hello, I'm Su Zhong Li, the head of the research office of WIPIC. Today, our center has invited four renowned experts on world heritage and development to this online roundtable dialogue. In this talk, we would like to share different ideas and perspectives on the issues between heritage conservation and development. Conservation and development has been one of the key issues in setting out the role and benefit of heritage in sustainable development. We hope our invited experts can navigate us to a direction that heritage interpretation can contribute in dealing with these issues. Now I'd like to introduce four invited experts. First, we have Dr. Gamini Wijeshriya, who is a special advisor to the Director General of ECROM. Our second guest is Professor Zahangir Kaidarov, who is the head of the UNDP Cyprus office. Our third guest is Professor Mario Santana Quintero, who is ECOMOS Secretary General and also Professor of Carleton University. Lastly, we have Mr. Tim Batman, who is Director of IUCN's World Heritage Program. Thank you for joining us today. Today we have prepared three questions for each expert. Firstly, I would like to invite Dr. Gamini Wijeshriya to ask about what would be the role of heritage in your area. Thank you. Thank you to all. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I have been invited to represent ECROM, or the International Center for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, based in Rome, which is one of the advisory bodies to the World Heritage Committee. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and let me convey the greetings from the Director General of ECROM, Dr. Beben Doro. Uh, ECROM, created by UNESCO in 1956, in the aftermath of the World War II, has the mandate to promote conservation of cultural property worldwide. It's an intergovernmental organization with 137 member states and implement its mandates through training, information, research, advocacy, uh, and cooperation. Development is a theme ECROM is grappling with since its beginning through such projects as Nubian Campaign. And uh, it's, we are, we are, ECROM is very much interested in this particular subject. And I will stop here. Okay, Professor Kaidorov. Yeah, thank you. It's an honor to be with uh, with you and with the you know the panelists here. And I think the topic is very important. You know, cultural heritage in Cyprus, it's uh, you know evolves from diverse and rich cultures and civilization which have populated the island throughout the history. So, you know, the island uh, of Cyprus is, is has been de facto divided in two parts since 1974, where we have a Republic of Cyprus, uh, you know, Greek secured community as a member of the uh, European Union. Uh, and then we have a, a Turkish secured community and the authorities in the northern part of Cyprus, which is which are not recognized. So and then the, the Cyprus joined European Union in 2004. And I think since since then, I think oh, UNDP in Cyprus started implementing projects and initiatives with the funding from the European Union to support the peace and confidence building process on the island. So I think for us, the, the, the heritage is become a means and tool to promote peace and confidence between two major communities, the, the Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot community, with the aim to, to you know, to enhance their first uh, cooperation, you know, between two communities. So we use the heritage as a tool and as a as an important element of development. 
and building trust and promoting peace on the island. And I think uh, the, the role of heritage in, in becoming even more important with this global crisis that is going on currently. We see how the heritage and cultural ties are important to, to keep the communities you know, uh, in, engaged and to promote this dialogue, which is uh, vital, I think, nowadays uh, in this uh, you know, crisis times. And since 2010, the United Nations Development Program and the European Commission have been assisting this process through the so-called uh, Technical Committee on Cultural Heritage that you know with the focuses that focuses to preserve the island's cultural heritage and they are members of the both communities regardless of this division and political differences the culture becomes a uniting and heritage become a uniting you know a platform for the uh, greek and turkish cypriots so the role of cultural heritage to support the peace and confidence building and increase level of trust between two main uh, communities on the island, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, becoming a very important, you know, uh, process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Maria Santana. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good night to everyone. Uh, and thank you so much to the uh, UNESCO World Heritage uh, interpretation and presentation center for putting this uh, very important event together and i'm also very happy to share this panel with colleagues you know from cyprus and ecrom and iucn who are also advisory bodies to the unesco world heritage convention like icomos the international council of monuments and sites is a non-governmental non-for-profit international organization and has been a partner to unesco and its member states for numerous projects and initiatives over the last 50 years, ICOMOS has been a pillar in the implementation of the World Heritage Convention. ICOMOS is a partner for developing and engaging reflections about today's global challenges to build a more robust and resilient cultural sector. At all stages, our national and scientific committees have been confronted with development that threatens the integrity of historic places such as the construction of, of transportation infrastructures, demolition of, of existing structures, incompatible additions to historic buildings, and many other projects. As one of the advisory bodies to the World Heritage Committee, ICOMOS is often, often involved in reactive monitoring missions to uh, assess the impact of those uh, projects on World Heritage properties and for other sites that are not listed on the World Heritage uh, Convention. ICOMOS has developed, in this case, the heritage alerts that permits raising awareness worldwide. Also, ICOMOS works collaboratively with other non-for-profits, governments, and industry in providing training and sensitizing communities about protecting the historic stock. And just to finalize my intervention, I think that uh, we see you know, a, a world in which we are arguing you know, for inclusion, equity, and diversity. And I think that development, you know, of um, of our cities and our built environment, is something that we cannot uh, prevent, but we can facilitate, you know, because cultural heritage and, and historic buildings, resources, etc., contribute to that uh, built environment. So working with people is really important, and I think that in the past, <clears throat> some have seen the you know the world heritage convention of other instruments to be very governmental rather to be something that we touch and feel and use right so um as an icomos member uh, besides being the secretary general and in particular living in canada i have real i have come to realize that you know building bridges is really important with all the organization root organizations not for profit organizations so to you know make people aware about our own built environment because it's interesting that people travel around the world and they visit these magnificent world heritage sites and they don't realize that next door there might be an important uh, monument or site that will be equally valuable as these others that they have visited and i think that that's that's part of that uh, learning and, and training that, that we need to to share and also i i was in a meeting in mundia called last uh, two weeks ago in Mexico, 
And I remember a phrase um, that was given in one of our side events that says about sharing power. And I think we need to share power with others, right? And, and whatever ICOMOS can, can have power, I think we need to share it. And, and I hope that uh, we can continue arguing and discussing about this. So thank you so much for the question and looking forward to the answers of the others. Thank you, Mr. Badman. Okay, well, thanks, thanks very much. And thanks um, both personally and on behalf of IUCN for the very kind invitation and great to, to see old and, old and new friends on, on the panel and in the audience. Um, so thank, thanks for uh, this good, good event. Um, so IUCN, uh, International Union for Conservation of Nature, we're the oldest um, and largest global network focused on the conservation of nature in the world, but we're also centrally engaged um, on the mission to achieve sustainable development. Our vision is a just world that values and conserves nature. So we see nature being part of um, what, what society as a whole uh, needs to sort of consider and include in in the in, in its futures and, the, and in development futures. Um, to answer your question specifically, so in IUCN Heritage, um, the position of Heritage has changed uh, in the last year. It's now connected as part of our new Centre for Society and Governance. And although I still lead the World Heritage work in IUCN, it's one focus and, and, and a key focus of a new team um, that I lead, which is the team for heritage, culture and youth in IUCN, and is also a team that provides the home for two major global initiatives, one on urban areas and nature conservation. So for the first time, we're bringing a concern for urban areas into IUCN's global program. Uh, and secondly, a new initiative on the connections between sport and nature conservation. Um, just specifically on the word her on heritage, I think it, it is still the World Heritage Convention that refers to nature and nature conservation as natural heritage. Uh, and so the World Heritage Convention is really the key focus for work that we do that, that use, uses the word heritage. Um, and there the priorities really are twofold. One is we have the core job um, as advisory body complementing ICOMOS and ICROM, but with our focus on, on the natural world heritage sites to secure their identification, protection and conservation in the way that uh, Mario has just been outlining for ICOMOS, but uh, it, you know, in, a, in a parallel way, um, IUCN has many of the same roles, but we also um, have come to see world heritage, in, uh, world heritage and the convention as a beacon for advancing place-based approaches that link nature to culture and people, and especially through uh, the World Heritage Leadership Program, which uh, thanks to Korea, you are uh, and CHA are one of the major funders of and supporters of and partners in, um, but where we try to bring forward, um, uh, I guess, a much more dynamic concern about the, the places and world heritage sites themselves that engage um, world heritage sites, site managers and focal points directly in um, bringing a whole um, whole strategies together for, for world heritage places. Um, heritage is central to every distinct and diverse place on the planet. Um, you know, it's a way to tell the complete story or the linked set of stories that bring um, bring bring uh, everything that's significant about a place together, embracing geodiversity, you know, deep time um, and biodiversity, uh, nature, habitats and species, um, but also cultural diversity. Uh, heritage is what makes local places distinctive. And so it really is a foundation for everything we're trying to do uh, to connect people to nature and to culture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we would like to move to the next topic, which is what causes the gap between conservation and development? Shall we move to Kamini? Thank you very much for the question. I think two decades ago, development was considered a threat, uh, therefore an enemy of heritage. In this case, so-called development included infrastructure, housing, and commercial activities and in and around heritage sites. Development sector, on the other hand, is of the view that heritage sector is a hindrance to development. This was the reason for creating gap between conservation and development. I think now we are all trying to bridge that gap. 
these activities, so-called development activities, on the other hand, are essential needs of people. It is in this context, development was considered only as a factor. Uh, in 2008, when the advisory bodies collectively developed the third periodic reporting questionnaire, uh, we collected a list of threats from ECROM, IUCN, and ICOMON. They all had a list of threats. And after long discussions, we considered, well, we can post threats, but they are also contributory. And we eliminated the title threat. We said factors affecting heritage, which can bring positive impacts as well as negative impacts. So it's important that uh, heritage processes uh, pay attention to uh, development activities. And for that, uh, the ECROM, e together with other advisory bodies, are uh, uh, developing tools such as HIA uh, recently published and so on, and also giving training into uh, consider uh, these uh, the, the at, at a particular point in the process of managing heritage, you need to look at the impact of uh, uh, development. And another uh, send, uh, the people, sorry. Um, ECROM endeavors to promote people-centered approach to conservation and management of heritage. This entails placing people at the heart of heritage discourse on the conviction that heritage has a role to play in the lives of the people. One of the ways to achieve this is through uh, the notion of development. And uh, of course, we are now moving from development to sustainable development paradigm, virtually replacing the notion of development. Sustainable development policy adopted by the World Heritage Committee can be a tool to assess diverse benefits that can be derived from heritage management processes. Assessing and sharing them among stakeholders is another way to bridge the gap between uh, conservation and development. Uh, indeed, ECROM is doing a lot of work in its training programs and sustainable development was introduced around 19, uh, late 90s and also uh, into number of training programs and also developing all sorts of tools and so on. In fact, uh, current director general is of the view that cultural heritage management is the rock on which sustainable development can prosper. And this is because cultural heritage is about our identity and about us. So uh, th yes, there is a gap between uh, conservation and development. I think it's important that we uh, bridge this gap because it's all about people and it's about heritage, heritage contribution to people and development contribution to heritage and people. I will stop here, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kaidarov. Sorry, your sound is off again. Did you start Thank you, Sujong. Thank you, Sujong. And you know, cultural heritage in, in developing nations uh, is a big part of the economic development and, and still growing. So uh, for us, the protection and preservation of cultural heritage uh, in, on the in the on the island in Cyprus is a crucial element of the recovery process, you know, because following the conflict and also the you know uh, the continuation continuation of the sustainable development, this become a very important part of the you know overall development. In in view of our complex situation prevailing in Cyprus, you know, political uh, challenges, low level of social cohesion you know, present a huge challenge and create high tensions between the 
Greek Cypriot community and the Turkish Cypriot community on the island. So I think context, uh, what we, we see as a gap is that context between Greek and Turkish Cypriots in, in their daily life is, is becoming more limited. The main reason of limitation is the absence of, of unified island. You know, there's a division, political division, and a pro proportion of the benefits can be, re you know, realized through greater integration of the two communities based on the greater cooperation, trust, uh, you know, which are achieved through the implementation of, of the this uh, confidence building measures by preserving the, the cultural heritage. There are several areas where meaningful pro progress is depend on the whole of the island approach, you know, and I think due to systemic and interlinked nature of the challenges, you know, both, uh, you know, the potential of, for greater bicommunal collaboration and the, uh, you know, where the progress can both bring immediate gain, gains, but also can pave the way for further integration uh, on the island. What we see as an impact is of the environmental dimensions, you know, the tourism, uh, is is a one of the main uh, you know economic you know uh, um, uh, potentials and, and parts of the economic development on the island, and I think related to this, uh, the, the 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 increasing gap between conservation and development because of the nature of the you know uh, 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 businesses oriented more towards you know income generation and the you know decision makers to, focusing more on development. I think the gap um, between the heritage and the economic uh, and, and, and development, and as as uh, as we said already, the sustainable development is is become is increasing. And how to bring it? I think I fully agree with our previous speakers that you know, educational elements, trainings is very important to to put standards in place, you know, and have a you know unified approach, uh, you know, globally. I think the standards will help the uh, nations and the governments to apply apply them in the in the practical context. And I think for us, uh, this you know uh, unifying the island and resolving the Cyprus issue, resolve, resolving the political you know uh, issues, will help to decrease this, minimize the gap. And we believe so, and that's why we our uh, you know uh, interventions in preservation of the heritage is so interlinked with. Uh, economic development. For example, on other hands, we when do, we do the works, uh, we you know generate jobs for the private sector, you know, and uh, we we run the we we run the educational programs. And I think one of the new elements that we are introducing is the digital heritage, which also another you know, bringing some innovative approaches to bring, to decrease this gap. I think this become also very important as a next further step. Thank you, Suja. Thank you very much. Um, next, uh, Professor Mario Quintana. Thank you very much. Um, before um, before I start talking about the gap, I would like to to mention two phrases. Uh, one by architect Carl Elefante. He says that the greenest building is the one that is already built. And then Susan Ross, a colleague of mine from Carton, mentions that heritage sites do not die they are damaged, demolished, or destroyed. So the effects of natural disasters like fires, earthquakes, flood, flooding, landslides, storms, hurricanes, are more the most significant causes of loss and damage to physical objects and human life. Furthermore, increasing abandonment development pressures of tourism, neglect, and other inflicted threats by human activity poses a real hazard to world heritage properties. But ICOMOS has recently published guidance for heritage impact assessment with ICROM and IUCN for UNESCO. And in this document, we have provided excellent ideas on how to conduct assessments that could bridge the gap between the need of development and good conservation practices. As the guidance indicates, World Heritage Sites have been facing increasing pressure from various forms of development in recent years, including urbanization, tourism infrastructures, dams, roads, power plants and other major interventions. This is confirmed by monitoring reports conducted by UNESCO together with the advisory bodies of, uh, to the World Heritage Convention. The guidance also uh, describes that impact assessments can actually help to identify better projects that yield more benefits in the long term, satisfying both conservation and development 
uh, needs. Furthermore, in the opinion of the author, or myself, <laughs> of this speech, the gap also is ignorance in the existence of historic places by the lack of comprehensive heritage inventories. Therefore, it is of paramount importance that these types of uh, inventories are conducted by authorities at municipality, city, regional, and country levels, and that they are conducted urgently, in particularly in emerging economies and low-income countries. Also, COVID-19, vi the biohazard that we have all suffered with pandemics and lockdowns worldwide, resulted in partial total restricted access to many World Heritage sites. Uh, the livelihood of local communities that depended on these uh, tourism visiting the sites have been substantially affected. And also in terms of World Heritage, I want to um, stress um, my colleague Sofia Lavadi's recent assessment of three of the six goals of the strategic action plan for the implementation of the convention. And this plan is from 2012 to 2022, basically for the 50th anniversary. And she namely, uh, those dealing with protection and management, the credibility of the World Health List and sustainable development underlies very serious issues that have prevented their effective implementation. In fact, the situation has worsened, according to Labadi, over the past 10 years, considering particularly the gap between heritage conservation the well being of local communities and sustainable development. I think that the involvement of right holders and, uh, and stakeholders should be encouraged at all levels. Cultural heritage is a very, very important for sustainability and therefore crucial for development. So I, I concur with my colleagues' opinions that, uh, you know, sustainability, I think, is our best bet, you know, about how heritage contributes to development. And I don't see, I see a, a clear gap, but I think that this gap is, is to be overcome easily if we have more dialogue, as I was saying before. But also uh, this, this idea of involving other stakeholders that in the, in the past we did not involve, we, they were excluded for one or other reason. You know, in Canada, we are going to a process of reconciliation. And in this process, we need to accept as we need to give, right? And um, we also need to identify that some of us are in a very privileged situation. And I think that this is really important in terms of, of heritage. How can we convey that heritage can be really good for um, you know, preserving the planet to offset the embodied carbon, etc. cetera. So I, I, and, and finally, I would like to say that I, I do believe in, in capacity building training but I also feel that we sometimes at the international cooperation level, we lack uh, policies to strengthen the role of heritage organizations worldwide. So we see, for instance, you know, in Korea uh, or, or in Canada, uh, heritage organizations have good resources, but in many low income countries, as, as our colleague was mentioning, they don't. And we provide programs for capacity building, but we don't provide programs to strengthen <laughs> Their, their legal um, and, and financial capacity to actually protect sites. So I think that this is also equally important. So thank you so much for the question and looking forward for the third one. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Mr. Batman. Yeah, well, look, thank, thanks for the question. I think most, most of what I wanted to say by way of the answers already been um, covered by the previous speakers. And I really pretty much agree with uh, what what's been said, um, you know, like uh, like Mario, I sort of started with the kind of question of is, you know, is 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 there a gap? And I think it's sometimes a perceived, but there really is often a real gap between conservation goals and development goals. Um, you know, the causes, as, as your question asked for, you know, are really diverse. And so I think you know you can only really diagnose a cause in a particular place. So, um, you know, listening to Mr. Kaidarov, you know, talking about Cyprus, you know, that, that, that's, the situ that's, that's the situation and that's where it needs to, you know, the, the gap needs to be understood in, in, a, in a particular place or in a particular geography. But if, if we make it more general, uh, maybe I'll just try to be, be quick and very synthetic. You know, it's a two-way street, I think. You know, why is there a gap? Um, you know, firstly, because development agendas frequently don't, consider conservation so you you know we often see in world heritage unsustainable development being called sustainable development if you see what i mean um we certainly see a growing range of 
direct threats to heritage, um, to natural sites, to cultural sites growing over time. And it's often the case that development proposals get put forward without really any consideration of, uh, of, of heritage and conservation goals. Um, you know, it's about short term returns, it's about reacting to a particular issue, and conservation doesn't get taken up as a as a priority. And so, uh, you know, we've, we've had several situations, and they tend to be high profile situations where the relationship between a development proposal and, and conservation is conflictual, you know, we um, have developments that essentially can't, can't go forward without creating unacceptable damage. And so we have, uh, yeah, you know, we, we, we frequently find ourselves in situations which, which are, um, uh, you know, conf conflictual. Um, so I think in that in that space, it's why we put our emphasis so much on uh, different proactive ways to address uh, conservation issues. It's a, it's a weakness of World Heritage, for instance, that everything is reactive monitoring. You know, it's too late, often when we when we pick up issues, and and so we need proactive techniques. And and um, Mario's just mentioned the, the work on heritage impact assessment, environmental impact assessment. You know, we see that as one of the really important techniques to focus on to anticipate issues before they come along look at alternatives and and you know find find solutions before a development is uh, you know committed to and very far down the tracks and too too late to uh, you know really too late to stop sometimes um so you know that's one set of issues coming from those different the different and diverse sectors that uh, you know put forward development proposals but it's certainly the case the conservation sector is um been been part of the problem very frequently uh you know frequently reacting to that to development as a negative and not a positive um you know being you know sort of waiting for the problem and trying to regulate it rather than being engaged in defining development futures that include heritage and include conservation as part of the package and there are several reasons for that i think i think skills and capacity is is part of it and i agree that it's not just about training and and and, and courses um, but it is about the sort of the whole ability for the heritage sector to act but certainly um you know the 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 the, the people that mediate the role of heritage need to be multi-skilled individuals um to be able to engage in these issues and uh, it, you know it won't it won't work if heritage professionals sort of sit sit there as technical specialists trying to you know just provide technical advice to issues so so capacity and skills uh, and having better strategies are are needed uh, and I think the work that we've done on on world heritage particularly through the world heritage leadership program um, you know there are many things to talk about but I'll just I'll, I'll just put forward two points that I think are often um, other root causes of um, of the issues, you know, why do we not engage? Uh, and the first is the tendency to only consider some values. So World Heritage Sites, you know, we tend to sort of guide towards outstanding universal value, but World Heritage Sites have other heritage values and they have um, values beyond beyond heritage values, their sort of relevance, their contribution. Um, so only considering, you know, some values is a way to, not make yourself fully relevant, but especially it's a way to leave communities and the aspirations and connections of communities out of the picture. Uh, and a second very frequent issue we see is that heritage sites tend to be sort of uh, frequently constrained by their boundaries. Uh, so world heritage site managers, you know, typically only feel like they've got agency influence and the ability to do things within limited boundaries. Um, of a heritage site. Sometimes these can be very small, um, but many of the development challenges and opportunities are about the bigger landscape, the bigger place, the bigger seascape, the bigger urban environment uh, where a heritage site is located. And unless our strategies capture that whole, the whole place, you know, the whole geography, uh, you know, not, not just the defined site, um, it's often very difficult to achieve um, the connection that's needed between conservation and uh, development outcomes. Um, there's lots more to say, and I, as I say, meant that the previous speakers have have said much more of what needs to be said. But I'll I'll leave it there in terms of adding to those answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Badman. Now we move on to the last topic, uh, which is how we we can achieve comprehensive cooperation between conservation and development through heritage interpretation and presentations. Dr. Gambini, which is Thank you, Fijong. Uh, I was thinking of your question, 
because interpretation is a site specific uh, venture and we could only interpret a particular stories to that particular site. But then I was thinking more and more since you raised this question. Yes, in fact, uh, I realized, or I think interpretation can help uh, first building trust among the developers and the people. In fact, uh, uh, I can bring one example quickly. We had uh, the goal well heritage site where there was a big port development proposed by the government and uh, UNESCO was questioning about it. And in fact, uh, uh, impact assessment suggested that yes, this development is necessary for the people of that area. But there was a, there was a question about uh, big cruise ships being brought to the site, which can bring a gold port like a place, a place like a uh, venue. So the conclusion was that yes, they can go ahead with a smaller development and uh, the, 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 that development is necessary for the people. I think this, if we can interpret at the site, this will build a lot of confidence among developers as well as people. Uh, people will realize, yes, heritage is being looked after despite development. On the other hand, development has been uh, taken care of for the people. Now, uh, point two is that uh, interpretation can uh, help to explain the benefits of development into that particular site. Uh, and I think uh, uh, the, the uh, third point is that we need to engage developers from the beginning, as Tim said, looking at all the values and from the values assessment, I think I have mentioned this again in the previous lecture on interpretation, we need to bring them also from the beginning, not at the end, and also in the process of assessing impacts like HIAs and so on. So if we can go forward in those direction, I think interpretation can help build trust among the developers as well as general public and also help uh, bridge this gap between uh, conservation and development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Professor Kaidorov. Thank you, Sujan. You know, um, for us, uh, uh, for UNDP uh, in Cyprus, you know, the comprehensive cooperation between conservation and development, it's, it's like, it's more a, a, a main focus of our work. And I think the, the issue, the, the challenges that we face is, I can, you know, summarize them in, in twofold. First, since the, uh, again, I'll bring it to the context of Cyprus as a post-conflict, and I think related to this experience can be, you know, uh, also adapted to any, uh, you know, a conflict uh, uh, places and, and post-conflict uh, places. The, the, the importance of access to the heritage, right? And, and when we, we talk about this, the, the, the link between conservation and development becoming very, very, you know, critical. And I think in this context, uh, what Cyprus model was 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 exemplary when the two communities, the Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot leadership, they created bicommunal technical committee on cultural heritage. I think that the members, renowned experts, you know, the committed professionals, that become the a very good uh, forum to discuss, interpret the heritage, and then you know focus on the preservation and link it to develop it. The issue was that it's not a legal entity. And I think the model where UN and UNDP in particular can step in as a neutral platform first, and also we provided the implementation mechanism as, as we can employ contractors while the committee is not the legal, legal entity. So I think the UNDP you know, 
one of the, our best practices, we provided the procurement human resources implementation platform to the committee and also the, the, the foster the dialogue. And I think this model worked very well uh, because as a more broader mandate of UNDP, we, we were able to bring the gender you know, element and also the engagement of the youth in this process become very, uh, became very important. I think the, uh, for us also the role of local communities in this in this question is very important, and I think the, in many things because sometimes the decision makers are are sort of in the more centralized you know uh, uh, locations in the capitals or in the other you know uh, regional headquarters. Where the, the beneficiaries, the stakeholders are more local to the to the sites to the heritage sites. I think engagement with the local community. Is another example where the UNDP um, uh, was able to 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 bring this element, and I think uh, I th this this heritage becoming more and more important uh, element of EU foreign policy. That you know, the, as culture is, you know, um, intercultural dialogue that can help prevent conflicts and you know foster reconciliation uh, between communities. And I think we are very you know, uh, thankful to the European Union, European Commission for the funding, also the, for the expertise. And I think this forum, this this discussion is so important because so for the first time I, of UNDP be, being a, a member of this panel, I already learned that so many cooperation, you know, channels we need to link and we need to learn from the expertise around this panel, particularly. And it's a very practical. It's, it comes. Uh, it can start with the trainings, exchange of best practices, lesson. And I like the, uh, uh, the uh, you know, the the point about this impact assessments. I think this is where I think this, this is a very good point that we are actually, unfortunately, our our actions are reactive to the post post scenarios. And I think preventing, predicting. We have so many tools nowadays. We can apply in, in when it comes to heritage, you know, the te technical, technological tools, innovative, you know, uh, tools. And I think this is very important. So we do more preventive, more, more prediction, more analysis. And it comes with just research and cooperation as we're doing now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Maria Santana. Thank you very much. And, and if you allow me, I will go directly into talking uh, about the strategies for presentation and uh, you know the use of technology because these are my uh, professional expertise besides being the secretary general of ICOMOS. So the development of strategies to present world heritage properties should take into account that they are inherent a special phenomenon and characterized by location, distribution and scale as Graham et al. Uh, mentioned in their publication. And properties have a specific geographic setting, components, attributes and features, boundaries and buffer zones. And for instance, those in a serial and transboundary sites, uh, and so an example of that is the Silk Road uh, sites in, in the in the in the listed. Uh, they were they were the nomination files were compiled through a comparative analysis, extensive comparative analysis that describe and try to justify all the outstanding universal values uh, criteria that were mentioned in that nomination. And I think that these type of uh, tools can be used to prepare these presentation strategies, you know, and also uh, be more inclusive if we have this process of analysis and how can we present this OUV criteria to all the stakeholders. Uh, also, a good publication is by Fran Matero uh, in, the, uh, in the publication is uh, that they produce at the University of Pennsylvania. And Matero in his introduction about, uh, about presentation, he mentions that any consideration of the interpretation and display of heritage sites demands reflection on three specific criteria questions. And he says, one, how should we experience a place, especially one that is fragmented, accredited and possibly illegible? How does intervention affect what we see, what we feel and what we know? And finally, how can display promote effective and active dialogue about the past across space and time? And I think that these three elements are really important when we are trying to work on an interpretation and presentation a strategy that could help to, to narrow that gap, right? Uh, so also Silverman indicates that presentation is one-way experience 
from the site to the visitor. However, nowadays with the evolution of digital technologies, this is no longer the case. We can prepare different presentation schemas about the site, and we can also have input from, from the person that is uh, going through that presentation uh, platform. I think that the establishment of the International Center for the Interpretation and Presentation of World Heritage Sites, WIPIC, uh, in Korea fills a gap in training, research, and mobilizing of best practices in presentation. The impact of WIPIP's effort can promote multi-directional dialogue through the use of digital technologies. And I think this is very important to narrow this gap. A traditional visit to World Heritage sites with a trained tour guide is, is no longer uh, just required. Um, we are more connected than we were ever before. And I think that the pandemic has, has proven this, you know, through the use of technologies and all of us coming from different places is changing through a virtual roundtable about the, this gap, right? Uh, however, with pro progress comes challenges. It is essential to understand that the quality of the information retrieved can be compromised rather than providing interpretation to a site that digital information could negatively impact perceptions about the values of the site uh, and the local community whose livelihoods depends on the qualities that attract tourists in the first place. So visitor experience expectations should be studied by interdisciplinary groups of heritage professionals who will respect the significance and integrity of that particular World Heritage Site. While acknowledging the privacy of communities, it is essential to ensure transparency in how digital content is collected and presented online and how these virtualized representations will create a solid sense of community and pride. Using digital technology is an excellent way to enhance visitors' experience at any World Heritage site, but it should also integrate the voices of local communities. So in my view, the next steps, are what to do in the next 50 years of the World Heritage Convention, how do they look like? Uh, would the improvement of the current interpretation and presentation uh, charter, you know, the NAMI charter prepared by by ICOMOS needs to be updated. So that could be a challenge and provide a new platform for, for good practice. Um, also preparing new uh, guidelines on, you know, what are the defining the essential skills for the multidisciplinary experts putting together interpretation and presentation of strategies. And finally, can we, can we um, you know, convince the industry to make purpose-built technologies for the interpretation and presentation of heritage uh, sites in general. And I think that we pick in this particular role can play a, a, an important aspect, you know, of convincing to find, you know, specific developments for our field of conservation. So I think finally that co co collaboration between ECOMOS, ECROM, uh, IUCN, UNDP, our colleague from, from Cyprus, and WIPIC and other heritage institutions can be instrumental in contributing to the effective adoption of interpretation approaches that will make presentation of World Heritage Sites more inclusive, equal, and embrace diversity. I think WIPIC can promote cultural pluralism using intercultural dialogue that is aware of inclusion and inequalities and also digital technologies are a strong means of preserving culture and present, presenting cultural diversity to, to the global community while providing access to previously unknown resources to recover assumed lost intangible heritage. Legal protection of cultural diversity focus, focusing on collective human and cultural rights and communities needs to be part of cultural politics. Social justice and peace needs to you to form part of the overarching aspiration of cultural politics for the future. And I think addressing all these issues is really important to try to, to narrow again that gap between conservation and, uh, and development through you know, the, the correct use of interpretation and presentation strategies. And with this, I, I thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to, to talk and, and give our views from ICOMOS and also my personal views about the three aspects we have been talking. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Lastly, uh, Mr. Badman. Okay. Well, thanks uh, again. Hard to, hard to come last in the in the list because lots of things have been said um, that I that I agree with. Uh, let me just try again to to, to synthesise an answer. Um, and this is a really good question. I think you, you've asked, and obviously this is, I assume, um, wanting to give some framing of uh, WIPIC's uh, sort of contributions. Um, I think it's important to say heritage interpretation is not a magic, uh, not a magic cure for the gap we're talking about, but I think it can certainly help 
um, actively in several different ways. Uh, I'll just pick on four to talk about. Um, the, the first is, is that good heritage interpretation really is about dialogue. Um, it's about understanding, it's about the meanings um, of a place to different audiences and different communities. So simply em embarking on interpretation as an activity opens up the sort of discussion that heritage needs um, in a place. Um, you know, why is this heritage important? You know, what stories do we want to tell? Who is this place relevant to? Um, you know, it's about establishing a narrative um, for, or narrative or narratives for heritage. And I think as um, Mario was saying, it's also a good, a good test of inclusion. You know, it's a good way to ask, are we including all the voices that the Heard. So I think the first thing that up, that's what happens. Um, so it ensures we're really focused on communication and outreach and making the case for, for conservation. And in my view, um, you know, what we do in conservation often fails because heritage manage, managers and nature conservation more generally you know, have very weak skills in, in communicating what's important, in engaging people in our mission. Um, you know, we tend to fall back on this sort of expert, uh, expertise sort of giving giving advice role instead of really, you know, engaging ourselves sort of more humbly in, in, in what places stand for and what communities want. Um, so interpretation is, you know, is a way to ensure that communication and connection uh, is part of our skill set, is part of our focus. Um, help to, to move forward. Um, thirdly, I think interpretation, as I think Gamini said first in this discussion, you know, it, it it's a really is a place-based approach. Um, and, and we know it works, it's rooted in decades of practice, you know, where it works, it works really well. And it's crucial to placemaking, um, to bringing forward what makes our heritage distinctive as a contribution to um, the, the 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 place we're trying to conserve you know what's compelling uh you know what touches us what excites us what engage engages us what what you know what what makes us feel um connected and and so this is really crucial to bring heritage to life uh to ensure all the values of heritage are being understood communicated talked about um and and it's a way to put what communities are concerned about in much greater charge of what a place stands for, you know, a, lo a lot of um, what what we need for you know proper sustainable development is is development which, res which respects the place and respects the community, and so connecting, reconnecting to past stories, you know, in the context of the present day, is is a crucial way that we 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 create the con we create the context for sustainable development and good development choices uh, and interpretation. I think can really contribute there. And lastly, though the list could go on, I think it's important to say that interpretation, you know, can create real opportunities that have direct social and sometimes economic value. You know, interpretation and place making adds value to a place um, itself. You know, it can even create a brand sometimes um, that can contribute for sure to tourism strategies, to attracting visitors, but also more generally making a place more attractive, making it livable, making it a place somebody you know wants to come for a job, uh, wants to set up a business. Um, and then of course, some interpretation services themselves can be income generating, you know, creating attractions, providing you know, walks, talks, uh, events, um, you, you know, services of different kinds. We've got to be careful in all of this that we remember that those objectives to make financial returns or social returns don't distort the task that interpretation has to, to tell the truth, um, to ensure authenticity and accuracy in the stories that they're told and the message that, messages that are del delivered. But these are all really, I think, important ways that interpretation things to be you know outgoing um, multi-skilled multi-connected heritage managers so i think there's there's a, a real set of contributions it's important to note that that those are only capable of being achieved as part of a comprehensive strategy to link conservation and development as a whole interpretation isn't as i say isn't the magic solution to everything you know it won't address infrastructure decisions it won't address lack of skills in education it won't address demographic demographic challenges it won't address pollution and environmental quality it won't address questions of rights and inclusion on its own but it can make an important contribution and it's definitely been overlooked um, as a focus in the world heritage system for a very long time uh, so 
in, in closing, you know, this event, more broadly, the focus um, that WIPIC is bringing um, to this issue is something that's long overdue and very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, four of you already. Um, it's really time goes fast. Uh, through today's online dialogue, we have shared different ideas on the issues between heritage conservation and development. Also, we have valuable perspective on the way how heritage interpretation can contribute in dealing with these issues. Thank you very much for your participation for all of you. Your advice will be a precious insight in developing future prospects on this issue and for our center. Thank you again.